Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be joining you this morning to talk about what's been for me the most exciting 12 months of my life. Um, and I think for the, you know, for the watching world as well, it's really made its mark. This is a discovery which found its way onto 960 front pages of the newspaper um, on February 12th of 2016. So it's a great relief that we didn't discover it on the day of the referendum. I think we may have struggled to get quite the same level of public attention. Um, but nonetheless, I want to share with you um, not just the recent discovery by the ground-based detectors, but the broader context and indeed the future prospects for gravitational wave astronomy. As Colin said, um, I've been given a very tough task by Hitoshi's wonderful talk. Um, and like him, as a humble astrophysicist, I find myself somewhat in awe of the instrumentation experts and engineers and scientists who've really made this possible. And really, I take my hat off to them and I uh, would refer to them all the difficult questions you may have for me about how the instrumentation works, but I will do my very best to share that with you and indeed perhaps also offer both a little entertainment and also 30 more minutes to let your ears get accustomed to Scottish accents. So, so there you go. Um, so despite coming from Scotland um, and only traveling from Glasgow to get here, I am speaking on behalf of the entire LIGO Scientific Collaboration. Um, that's more than a thousand scientists across about 60 institutions worldwide. So um, basically when Colin invited me to give this talk, it was already um, a great honor to be asked and it was in December of last year as we um, had just passed the 100th anniversary of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now what I knew, but what Colin didn't know was as I said, that in February we would be announcing this. So in February 11th of this year, we announced a discovery which took place on September 14th of 2015. And although the last year has been the most exciting and challenging of my life, um, it was also rather tiring because for more or less five or six months, uh, we were all surviving on very little sleep as we tried to convince ourselves that we really had discovered something. So again, as my talk unfolds, hopefully I will convince you of that as well. So the background to this is that gravitational waves, as I'm sure almost everyone in the audience will know, are ripples in the curvature of space-time, predicted theoretically by Einstein 100 years ago. And the reason we're so interested in them as astronomers is that they offer us a completely new way to probe the universe, to gain information about the changing of gravitational fields, um, often in some of the most extreme environments out there, from exploding stars or colliding black holes, perhaps even from the Big Bang itself. So they're produced when you um, accelerate mass violently, um, from things like compact objects like neutron stars and black holes as they coalesce together. And they could also be produced in less violent events such as um, a rotating neutron star, a pulsar, which is not spherical. So it's got a little bump in its surface and that will produce the asymmetry that would give us those ripples in space time. Now technically, as I do this, I'm also producing gravitational waves. But because the mass of my hand isn't close to that of a neutron star, and because I'm not moving it close to the speed of light, then the calculations that Einstein and others did soon after the initial prediction was made, made it very clear that such artificially generated gravitational waves were almost unimaginably weak. And it says a lot to say that because even the ones produced astrophysically are fairly unimaginably weak, but the ones we might produce artificially are even weaker still. We need to use the cosmos as a laboratory in order to try to detect these gravitational waves. How would we detect them? Well, they would manifest themselves as changing strains in space. That's changing fractional lengths, fractional proper lengths, to use the, um, the, 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 the formal relativity um, language, um, in some form of detector. But the kinds of typical strain amplitudes that we might expect to obtain from astrophysical sources, even like the merger of black holes or neutron stars, would be of order 10 to the minus 21 or less. That's one part in 10 to the 21. So this was an enormous technological challenge, which for many decades was thought by many physicists and astronomers to be simply insurmountable. But nonetheless, back in the 1970s in Glasgow, um, a group began to work on this topic. So who you see here is Professor Jim Huff and Professor Ron Drever. So Ron moved from Glasgow to Caltech in 1984, having spent a few years um, shuttling back and forth between the two locations. And in fact, in the 1980s, 
Ron became one of the co-founders of the LIGO project, of which I'm going to say lots more in just a few minutes. He left behind Jim, who at that stage was a research fellow in the early 70s, and this is one of the detectors that they worked on in those early years. It's a bar detector. So what the um, key principle was, was to use the idea that you would excite resonant frequencies in a bar of, let's say, aluminium as a gravitational wave passed by. Now, there were a number of disadvantages of such an approach, um, chiefly that you're only sensitive to gravitational waves in a very narrow range of frequencies. But nonetheless, there was much optimism at that time in the early 70s, and building on the earlier work of Joseph Weber from the previous decade, which in fact had claimed um, a gravitational wave detection, although that was never verified because it was only with a single detector. Now, Jim took his bar detector onto the BBC television show Tomorrow's World, which some in the audience may recall. I used to be an avid viewer of that in the 70s and 80s and confidently predicted on the show that, yes, one day we would detect gravitational waves. But in the 1980s, this, the, the, the main focus switched away from bar detectors to laser interferometry. And that's basically what the L and the I stand for in LIGO. So the LIGO detectors are Michelson interferometers. They are vast instruments, probably the most sensitive scientific instruments ever built. Those L-shaped arms are four kilometers long. There are two detectors in Hanford, Washington State, and Livingston, Louisiana. And the passage of a gravitational wave would produce something along the lines of the effect you see in the lower right corner. Of course, greatly exaggerated. If it was that easy, we would have detected them decades ago. But what you see is the stretching and squashing of space-time, so that change in the strain, the strain amplitude, as a gravitational wave passes by. And that means that if you take a laser beam, well, in fact, what I'll do is make use of a, a rather better animation to, to show the same principle, and you pass it through a beam splitter, reflect the, um, the laser light of the mirrors at the end of each arm, and then recombine them, then as a gravitational wave passes by, it will change the phase of the laser light in the two arms because the light has traveled a different path, um, a different length of path, and therefore takes a different time to arrive back at the beam splitter. So that's the basic principle, but of course, those unimaginably small strains that we're trying to search for demand incredible technology in order to measure them. So what we have in the now advanced LIGO detectors, the upgraded detectors that began operation in the autumn of last year, as I'll explain in more detail in a few moments. Well, those two detectors have the basic Michelson setup, but with a number of important upgrades. First of all, there's um, a signal recycling system that keeps the signal in the optical cavity for a longer time, and there's also um, a power recycling mirror that overall boosts the power, and the, the overall gain in sensitivity is several thousand through those refinements. Um, what you see is that there's a frequency sensitivity which varies substantially across the frequency range, such that there's a kind of sweet spot at a frequency of a few hundred hertz, but at much lower or much higher frequencies, the sensitivity rapidly degrades such that um, we would really struggle to detect gravitational waves from a ground-based detector at those lower or higher frequencies. One of the key reasons why we have two LIGO detectors it was not a buy one, get one free deal, I hasten to add. This is one of the most expensive projects ever undertaken by the National Science Foundation with significant further funding from the UK and other national agencies. But the key factor here is to make sure that you have a way to verify a true signal by hopefully detecting it in both the Hanford and the Livingston detectors. And there's a 10 millisecond light travel time. They're about 3,000 kilometers apart but nonetheless um, allowing for that, or in fact, as we'll see a little later, a slightly shorter delay time in some cases. But let me just mention that now. The wavefront that passes the LIGO Livingston detector, um, well, it may be a different part of the wavefront that passes the LIGO Hanford detector. So in fact, if I cut to the chase, in our September 14th detection of last year, the light travel time, the gravitational wave travel time, was only seven milliseconds. And that gives us some insight on the direction on the sky from where the gravitational waves came. Again, I'll return to that point a little later. So going from the initial LIGO detectors to advanced LIGO involved trying to push the sensitivity by about a factor of 10. And in fact, we're not there yet, 
Advanced LIGO is already up and running. It's already made a discovery, but there's further gains in sensitivity still to come. Again, I'll mention those right at the end. So how do we achieve those gains? Well, um, there were three main areas that had to be upgraded between the completion of the initial phase in the late um, years of the last decade and then the beginning of the advanced LIGO era in 2015. One was to have higher power lasers, which would gain us some sensitivity in the high end of the frequency range. Another was to have much better vibration isolation at the low frequency um, range, and then in the mid frequency ranges to use mirrors with coatings and also with um, suspensions that would guarantee them better thermal noise um, performance, lower thermal noise. And that's really where the contribution of our group in Glasgow was most striking, um, because what Glasgow led as part of a UK consortium funded by the Science and Technology Facilities Council was the construction and installation of some uh, quadruple suspension systems. So that means that the test mass, the mirror which the laser beam reflects from, I'll just like my laser pointer is right now, um, was suspended on a series of four stages and that helped to isolate that lower test mass much more effectively to effectively create one of the quietest places in the universe. One of um, the places, at least until we got those Lisa Pathfinder results that Colin briefly mentioned in his opening remarks, which was almost completely isolated from any local noise disturbance. So specifically, the work done in Glasgow focused on two main areas. One was to replace the piano wire, the steel wire suspensions that had been used on initial LIGO with silica fibers. And these were pulled using a fiber pulling machine in Glasgow. And also to look very carefully at ways in which the attachment of those silica fibers to the test masses could be done in a way that would mitigate those thermal noises as much as possible. So this gained us considerably in the sensitivity in um, the low end of the, the LIGO window. So that's tens of hertz through to hundreds of hertz. And in fact, as we'll see in a moment, that proved to be crucial in making the first detection. So around May of last year, we had completed the upgrades that had been taking place from 2010 through to 2015, um, completed on time and on budget. And over the course of the summer of 2015, there were a number of engineering tests planned, but those were leading up to the first scheduled observing run that was due to begin on September 18th. Now, fortunately, those engineering runs were completed a few days early, and boy, are we glad that we began taking data because what we saw, or rather, what we heard on September 14th sounded like this. Oh, can we have some sound, please? I have no idea why we're not getting sound, but anyway, what you can see is the sweep upwards in frequency as time advances in that final half second before the merger of the two objects that we'd identified. I should add, of course, that the real signal only happened once. What I'm showing in the, the movie, which does make it rather easier to see, and indeed if we did have sound, also possible to hear, is repeated over and over again. So we're considering here a system which had been approaching each other perhaps for millions or even billions of years, but only during that final fraction of a second did it enter the LIGO detection band as the frequency of gravitational waves produced increased so much that it, it fell into that band of a few tens to a few hundreds of hertz in which advanced LIGO had sufficient sensitivity. But what you can hopefully immediately see by eye, even though we can't hear it, is that the LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livington signals were A, very strong, and B, remarkably similar. So this, well, I was in China at a workshop at the time when we got the alert, but we really knew within just a few hours that we were in business. And of course, naturally, the first thing we wanted to assure ourselves of was that this was not just, um, for example, what we call a blind injection, which is where an artificial signal is injected into the data stream in order to keep the data analysts like me on our toes. We'd been doing this during some of the runs with initial LIGO, actually to very good effect, 
One of these signals was referred to as the big dog because it purported to come from the constellation of Canis Major, but it was just one of these blind injections. But it had helped to shift the psychology of the collaboration towards a mode where we would genuinely believe that this was possible, that we could detect a signal if one were really there. Now, rest assured, that's not the sound of our um, uh, LIGO detection. That's just a mobile phone. But if you're interested, if you go to our LIGO.org website, you can actually download the sound of these chirps, as we call them, as a mobile phone ringtone. So, um, so please, I would encourage you to do that um, in future. Anyhow, let me move on to um, a few of the key results that emerged after we'd all got over our, our initial shock and just astonishment that we'd been so lucky as to get such a strong signal in these first few days of operation. And um, of course, then the hard work began, which was to turn that in to proper astronomy, to try to not just confirm the detection, but also to characterize the signal. So we refer to this signal as GW150914. So I know it's not the most exciting nomenclature, and I'm not quite sure what we'll do if we discover two in one day, but I'm sure we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But this is the day on which the um, signal was recorded by the two detectors in um, Livingston and in Hanford. You can see that the two raw data signals are very well correlated with each other. And what you see um, superposed on that is um, a reconstruction of the signal, but, but a kind of robust one, one that doesn't involve um, significant assumptions about general relativity, but essentially just cleaning up the data using things like wavelets, using um, particular um, reconstruction algorithms that are designed to be non-parametric. But what that does is reinforce um, the um, uh, visual appearance of the two signals as being very similar to each other. And then, once one does compare with a bank of templates which are generated by numerical relativity, so that's um, basically working out what the merger of two compact objects should look like in gravitational waves, then we found excellent agreement. So we see, first of all, again, that chirp, the one that we didn't quite hear, um, we see the rise in frequency as a function of time. What I'll do actually is I'll try and do the chirp myself because I've been doing this a lot in public outreach. And um, in fact, you know, um, even in primary school, they, they, the kids just love this. They love being able to make the sound of two black holes colliding. So the point is, of course, gravitational waves are not sound waves, but we can render them as sound waves because the frequencies produced during these final moments before the merger correspond to frequencies that the human ear can hear. So the sound of our two compact objects, our two black holes merging, would be a little bit like this. There you go. That's it happened. Thank you. <laughs> now, if you do want to come along to my talk on Thursday, you'll get to hear a lot more audience interaction because, in fact, there's a neat way to demonstrate not just the sound of a chirp, as I just did, but also the significant technological challenge we had to overcome where you encourage the audience to make as much noise as possible, thus making it much harder to hear me do the chirp. But I'll, I'll save you from that this morning, but come along on Thursday and, and we'll maybe do our own little bit of a recreation of the challenges of discovering advanced LIGO events. So here we see one of the figures from our um, physics review letters paper that was published on February the 11th. And this is already very highly cited. And indeed, we broke the internet for a little while as people were trying to download the paper. And it has been um, an astonishing few months as we've seen um, just the interest and enthusiasm this has generated in the wider astrophysics community as well as the general public. I mentioned the 960 or so front pages. What exactly does all of this mean? Well, it gives us a whole new way to observe the universe, a whole new astrophysical toolbox. Gravitational waves are produced by these large accelerated masses and their amplitudes and phases give us information. There is interest in a stochastic background of gravitational waves. That is um, another area that we're, we're looking at and indeed would hope to try to um, place better constraints on in the future. But when you've got a resolved source, you can gain a lot of additional information about the astrophysical nature of that source. You can do precision timing, which as I mentioned before, gives us some insight into where on the sky the gravitational waves came from. And well, that chirp that I rather foolishly tried to produce myself, if you look at the equations that represent it, 
Well, there's a particular combination of the masses of the two bodies that we call the chart mass, and that's really pretty well constrained from analysis of the waveform. It depends on the frequency and the frequency derivative and how they change um, over time. And indeed, more detailed analysis of that shape allows us to also estimate the full system parameters, the individual masses, whether the bodies are spinning or not, the distance, and that distance is really um, one of the most exciting um, new avenues of all, because it's even got its own name. We refer to supernovae as standard candles, while gravitational wave sources, such as two merging black holes, we can think of as standard sirens, meaning that um, we can gain insight on the relationship between distance and redshift, and perhaps in the future, use those ideas to help to answer some of the questions that Hitoshi was referring to about the nature of dark matter and dark energy. So here is an animation that was produced based on some of those numerical relativity simulations. And it emphasizes that in that final fraction of a second, about 0.2 of a second, there was a huge burst of gravitational wave energy released. One way to think about that is in terms of the masses of the two constituent black holes before and after the merger. So we estimate their masses before as something like about 30 and 35 solar masses, adding up to 65, but the final black hole had a mass of only 62 solar masses. So in about 0.2 of a second, the equivalent of three solar masses was released in the form of gravitational wave energy as the space-time curvature reorganized itself due to this merger event. Now, if you think of that as a power energy per unit time, then it's about 50 times more than the light power generated by every star in every galaxy in the observable universe. So I think it's time for another Darth Vader reference. I think it was he that once said you should never underestimate the power of the dark side of the universe. And I think our event does rather demonstrate that because we must remember that there's no theory that would predict at the moment any electromagnetic radiation given off from two such merging massive black holes. Notwithstanding that, partnerships that we had with a lot of astronomers went to look for such EM emission. Again, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So here's just a little bit of detail on some of those numbers that I've already mentioned. The fact that we've got component masses of about 30 and 35 times the mass of the sun. We couldn't constrain the spin of the individual black holes terribly well. So that's just um, captured here by the fact that the big blob of probability is centered on zero. So in other words, the data are consistent with the black holes not having any spin, which probably just means that they don't have very much spin. But with better data in the future, we would hope to constrain that sort of thing rather better. The inclination of the system is coupled together with its distance, but nonetheless, we estimate the distance to be somewhere around about 1.3 billion light years. So it's an example of something that truly did happen a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. There's all sorts of facts and figures about this first event I could give you, but let me just focus on the one that's a 65 solar mass black hole. So if we were to plonk that black hole in the middle of the Atlantic, this is not a metaphor for the referendum again. I prepared this slide some time ago, but it gives you an idea of the scale. This would be the size of the event horizon in relation to the size of the Earth. So this is a fairly small object, even by terrestrial standards, but it packs quite a punch given that it's got a mass of 62 solar masses. Um, again, I just mentioned that there's been a huge amount of interest um, about this event, and here's one such example just this week in Nature. Um, there's a paper published by some of our collaboration members looking at plausible formation mechanisms for such a massive black hole system, because, you know, we were surprised to discover two of order 30 solar mass black holes merging together. It's not the kind of thing we really expected. We expected that there might be um, lots of lesser mass black holes among the first detections, but this was a big beast, and consequently it presents some challenges as to how you make them. And that, I think, is one of the most exciting things about this new window on the universe opening up. I mentioned a moment ago about following up in electromagnetic radiation. So there was a consortium agreement between LIGO and many teams working across the electromagnetic spectrum, looking for evidence of EM emission from this event. None was found. There was some um, interest in a possible gamma ray signature, but it does look as if that probably wasn't associated with our merger event. 
But one of the reasons all of this is tough is that with only two LIGO detectors, our ability to localize the source in the sky is very poor. The way we get that sky localization relates to what I said near the beginning about the, sh the small time delay, seven milliseconds of time delay, that gives us insight into where the gravitational waves came from. But with only two detectors, you get basically a ring on the sky. And that's a lot of sky area to go look at with EM telescopes. But we do expect that to improve dramatically in the future. Now, time presses, I should um, say a little bit more about the results of the first event and then get on to what's happened since. Firstly, let me mention that Einstein, I think, can sleep easily because thus far, it does look as if general relativity fits extremely well. And this graph, rather complicated, but the thing to emphasize is these were lower limits on various parameters that would characterize departures from general relativity. So if you've basically got those very small, then it says that GR passes the test. Or more correctly, I suppose what we should say is hasn't yet failed the test would be the, the, the more correct scientific way to put it. In the same vein, we can put limits on the Compton wavelength of the graviton. If the graviton's a massless particle, then the Compton wavelength should be infinite. And the limits we now get from this first gravitational wave event are better than they had been from either solar system tests or studies of binary pulsars with, for example, radio emission. So a lot still to do, but already it would seem um, that Einstein uh, was indeed right, which is uh, one of our hashtags at the time of the first detection was indeed that Einstein was right. We did consider um, replacing that with Einstein isn't wrong yet, but we thought again, perhaps that might give the wrong idea. <laughs> anyway, to move to more recent events, as I'm sure you're aware, just two weeks ago, we had a second confirmed detection. So this rather spoiled my Boxing Day evening on December 26th, but nonetheless, it was still a very exciting period. It took a number of months to lock this one down as well, but we were delighted to announce this at the WS meeting in San Diego on June 15th. So what's this second event that we've seen? Well, the most important thing to highlight is that unlike the first event, it's not easily visible by eye. You've really got to dig this one out of the noise. We got it using the technique that we call match filtering that involves comparing a bank of templates with different parameters with the signal and looking for correlations. But this one spent one second in band. So the in-spiral phase before the merger was observed for much longer than it had been with that first event. So here we go. This is the um, characteristics of this system. The two black holes in this case were about 14 and eight times the mass of the sun, 22 before merging to become 21 solar masses. And also what we were able to measure this time almost certainly one of those black holes has spin. And the measurement of spin is going to be key in the future as a way to discriminate between some of those formation models for these black holes. So again, we're really beginning to do proper astronomy. So here's the graph that shows that. So you can see that for one of the black holes, then we're fairly sure that our spin measurements um, are bounded away from zero at 90% confidence. Um, and that says that it's spinning at up to about 0.6, 60% of the maximal spin allowed for such a black hole. And there's even tighter GR limits. Again, the numbers don't really matter, but what you see is from the first detection, the one from last September, and then combined with the Boxing Day event, then we're getting even closer bounds on zero. So Einstein's still passing the test, but we're closing in on any deviations from GR that might be lurking there. There was, in fact, a third candidate event. It doesn't get called GW. It just gets called LIGO-Virgo transient. This happened in October and had a lower um, signal-to-noise ratio, but nonetheless um, can still contribute to our estimate of the overall rate of such events. Even though we're not sure it truly was an event, um, it can still help to inform our estimate of how many such events are likely to be occurring out there in the universe. And that's where we come to really questions about the future. So first of all, the sky localization for these three events was not terribly precise. Um, I already mentioned that. That's going to get better with a global network of detectors. And that's going to be crucial for following up with electromagnetic telescopes to look for the EM signatures of these events. So that's where things will develop in a very exciting way in the years to come. Later this year, Advanced Virgo will begin operations, so our partners in the Virgo collaboration are busy upgrading right now. LIGO India has been approved in principle, 
and um, is going to become operational early next decade. And indeed, even before that, the three kilometer detector Kagra in Japan will come online as well. So the more such detectors we have, the more baselines we have, the better sky localization we can achieve. And this graph sort of captures a little bit of that. Here we can see um, the two Hanford detectors and Livingston and also Virgo. And these are the sizes of the error boxes on the sky. So not quite as bad as from our first two detections, but still rather large if you want to go look with an EM telescope. But then adding LIGO India early next decade, things will rapidly improve. Now, as I said before, there may not be an electromagnetic signature from two merging black holes, but there are many other sorts of events where we do expect an EM counterpart, most notably neutron star binary mergers, where we're looking for a gamma ray burst. So that's going to be a very exciting area as well. And I think I'm into my last five minutes. Yep, excellent. I think should just about be on schedule. So this I've already mentioned that LIGO's made the first measurements and that they're heavier than we really expected. Um, it's allowed us to see black holes close up for the first time and to um, look at testing GR rigorously with the waveforms produced and comparing those with the predictions of the theory. Um, we are going to restart with our second observing run, O2, in the autumn of this year, and Virgo will join um, soon thereafter. And as you can see from the graph on the right, this is from a paper we put on the archive just a few days ago. If you go through O2 and then into O3, the third observing run, which is in, um, going to happen in 2018, then there's a very good probability that we'll be seeing upwards of 30 to 70 black hole binary sources. So that's our updated estimate based on what we've seen so far as representative of the population out there. Now, of course, only time will tell, but this does suggest that there's rather more of these binary mergers out there than we could, frankly, have hoped for, and it's a very exciting phase. So in my final couple of minutes, let me just mention two things. One, to highlight the fact that all of our data, many of the, um, the products that are referred to in the papers, they're available in a form that you can play around with for yourself. So go visit the LIGO Open Science Center if you want to download some of the data and some of our analysis software so that you can um, play around. Or indeed, as I mentioned, you can download them as ringtones. But um, why not do both? You can do some science and you can change your phone ringtone as well. But let me end by just also giving um, due praise and credit to the enormous achievement of my other Glasgow colleagues and indeed the worldwide community working in LISA Pathfinder. This is um, incredibly exciting because it offers the prospect of not just opening up a new window, but multiple windows in the gravitational wave universe. Um, all I've mainly talked about so far has been the high frequency end. But with LISA Pathfinder, we stand in the threshold of perhaps being within the next 15 to 20 years, let's say. Let's be uh, cautious, although I would very much welcome any opportunity to bring it forward. Um, but what we're looking at is the prospect of space-borne gravitational wave detection. So let me just say that um, <laughs> we'd originally scheduled our second um, ground-based detection press conference for the 7th of June, but we quickly decided that wasn't a good idea. Let's spread the goodies. So we um, rescheduled ours for 15th June to pave the way for the 7th of June to be the announcement of the early results from Letha Pathfinder. And they are really quite beautiful. Um, what we see here is that Lisa Pathfinder has achieved femtog relative acceleration noise. So basically able to control the position of the test masses on board the spacecraft to um, a precision um, that's equivalent to about 10 to the minus 15 g, which is really quite remarkable. So that now becomes truly the quietest space, in, uh, the quietest location in space. And that optical bench um, was uh, a major project for um, our group in Glasgow, together with colleagues um, elsewhere in the UK and indeed across the entire collaboration. And it's a tremendous achievement, I think, to put space-ready hardware together, successfully get it launched and see such beautiful results from um, a small university team. So it really does pave the way for the future success of LISA, the Laser Interferometric Space Antenna. And I personally cannot wait for us opening up these multiple windows, I believe, in those terms, 
that the prospects for Lisa, which I believe some other speakers will see a little bit more about next week, are even more exciting where you're looking at detecting gravitational waves from much more massive black holes, the supermassive black holes that lurk at the center of almost all galaxies. So watch this space, or should that be watch this space time? I think there's a very, oops, no idea why that happened. Um, I only had one more slide and it said bright future ahead. So let me just see if I can get that and I will stop. Thank you very much.